7,377 Lancasters built. 3,249 of those lost on operations. Listen to the sound of those beautiful Merlin engines. Hurricane now in from the right. Developed from the unsuccessful Manchester, much revered in his home country. sold to John Dale and Sons. Instead of scrapping it, they presented it to the RAF Museum at Cologne for display until 1967. As I said, Al revered in New Zealand. And uh, his nephew, Brendan, He's currently keeping up the tradition. He has put together a collection of uh, aircraft at what they call the Biggin Hill Hangar at uh, RNZAF Base Ohakia, containing a, uh, a Spitfire 9 painted in the markings of Aldir. Now coming in low from the right, the Hurricane. Originally served with number 63 and number 26 squadron. Served on various station flights as well. And also appeared in the uh, movies Angels 1-5, Rich for the Sky and The Battle of Britain. It was fitted with gusset plates and rivets that held that together and wire braced. Typhoon and the Lancaster. This is the first time here at uh, Midlands Air Festival. Look at that ladies and gentlemen. That is incredible, ladies and gentlemen. Put your hands together for that fly past. Celebrating the 80th anniversary this year of Operation Chastise, the bombing of the dams, accomplished by 617 Squadron, led by Guy Gibson. The typhoon today 
just hanging on there if you see that very high angle of attack keep formation with the Lancaster Typhoon today flown by Matthew Brighty, Flight Lieutenant, who also flew with 617 Squadron. Certainly not on the dams raid. That is simply brilliant, ladies and gentlemen. And this is a first here at Ragley Hall. and then it completely overtaken by the roar of the typhoon. That is amazing. Look at the size of that fighter compared to the four engine heavy bomber of World War II. So we were expecting one fly past. We weren't expecting three. This is really super special. We are really being spoiled here at the Midlands Air Festival. We certainly are. So at some point the um, typhoon is going to break away and do its display. And uh, just a, a noise warning, ladies and gentlemen, anyone today with us who is particularly sensitive to noise, please cover your ears for the next part of the So both these aircraft are based at RAF uh, uh, Coningsby up in Lincolnshire. Um, the, their hangars are very close together, they've got a very strong team bond. Bombers, break, break, go. This is break. Go. Look at that. to 20,000 pound thrust, EJ thrust over gravity. <laughs> Flown by uh, Flight Lieutenant Matthew Brighty today from 29 Squadron, this specially marked Typhoon. Incredibly capable aircraft, 27 millimetre Mauser cannon, 13 hard points for up to 19,800 pounds of weapons. Air to air, air to ground missiles. Up to 9G I'm told. So nine times your body weight, ladies and gentlemen, pushing you down into the seat. It's a huge amount of weight. Look at that. Beautiful nice. slow roll. Beautiful slow roll. Getting down from uh, a maximum of 600 down to about uh, 120 knots. 
So they do most of their practice. We've been talking about you know, practice and how these display pilots do this. And with this aircraft, they do a lot of it in the simulator because this aircraft costs a huge amount of money to fly. This looks Very like high alpha pass. Yeah, super slow. Beautiful opportunity to get your cameras out and take some photographs. Very high angle of attack there. Pilot and uh, computer working hard. Look at this, the afterburner. So a lot of these manoeuvres we're seeing that we've seen all day. Loops, rolls, tight turns, slow passes, fast passes, just the different aircraft make types that make it all the difference. And 40,000 pounds of thrust. <laughs> aircraft showing that distinctive colour scheme that you can see under the, on the bottom side of the aircraft. Um, they'd love to have a chat to you about all things Typhoon and they've got stickers to give away as well. So just like all the military teams we're seeing today, these pilots go through rigorous training and then have to pass an official flight test to make sure that they are fit enough to fly and their display is suitable for the public. So um, the pros have just uh, been through the air. The aircraft is describing a circle over the ground while rolling, a very difficult manoeuvre to fly when you're sat in the cockpit, let alone doing it from the ground. over at the top if he was sat in that cockpit that would be very uncomfortable with a lot of negative G but less so from a standing position on the ground now an inverted flat spin from which he recovers very nicely with a succession of rolls just showing the power of those ailerons And this is what the pilot would have actually been doing uh, when he was on his duty in his patrol area. Down low, trying to spot the uh, opposition, whether or not that was troops or uh, concentrations of ammunition. And this uh, particular aircraft 
was used in that role and stayed uh, at Germany, was based over there at Buchberg. These aircraft were uh, exported to 11 different military air arms. The RAF actually operated 13 different squadrons and one operational training unit. I know with the RAAF, Royal Australian Air Force, we used two that were uh, uh, employed as part of the Antarctic expeditions in 1953-54 and on the 55-56 voyage. Brilliant visibility from up there. Very precise handling. I think Kevin looks like he's having a lot of fun up there, doesn't he? And showing the capability of the aircraft to really keep within the boundaries of the airfield. He certainly uh, has displayed this aircraft for quite a while. And I believe that it was Midlands that he did his, his very first display. So all those manoeuvring you can see up there. Very nice approach there. No! And a score out of 10 for that would be 10. Absolutely. Oh. more of a growl to it. Definitely. On the pilot today, Chris Hadlow, I had the pleasure of working with for a few years, and uh, he will have the biggest smile on his face today. Um, it was a dream of his to fly the Spitfire. Um, RAF pilot, he spent some time in France with the uh, French Air, Air Force. three machine guns right the way through to the end of the war with the four 20 millimeter cannon which became the standard armament of uh, British fighters including all of the early jets. The Rolls Royce Spitfire has got a very distinct kind of blue grey colouring so Pete tell me about the different sort of colour schemes of, that you might find with Spitfires. Well if you look at that major production version of the Mustang.
Mustang first flew in October 1940 and actually resulted from the British Purchasing Commission going to the United States. Uh, of course, at that time, things were very dire and uh, looking to the Americans to produce uh, light bombers and fighters for the RAF. Went to Curtis, who uh, uh, were going to let them license produce the um, P-40 and that license production was to be by North American Aviation. But they counted and said we can build you a better aircraft with the same engine in the time that it would take us to produce the jigs to build the P. Had some world beating um, design features. One of those was the laminar flow wing and also the coolant system actually provides thrust for the aircraft. Ah, uh, sorry, the B model. It had the high back, very similar to the Spitfire that you just saw, and it uh, wasn't until November 1943 that, in an effort to increase visibility, they fitted the bubble canopy, which is uh, a design feature and a recognition feature of the P-51D. 650 caliber machine guns could carry up to 10 air-to-ground rockets and or a combination including up to a 1,000 pound bomb under each wing. Extremely long range. About 1,830 nautical miles with drop tanks. ability to uh, operate in the Pacific from places like uh, Iwo Jima. And of course these days you can go flying at the Spitfire. Two-seat Spitfires available at various airfields around the UK. Uh, Biggin Hill, Duxford, uh, Goodwood, where you can go and actually fly inside one yourself, there which are, is fantastic. There are so many of those uh, two-seaters now flying, single-seaters converted, or original two-seats uh, that were produced. The very one. Of course, it's the fastest. Well, I like red. It's always red. So pick the, your favourite aircraft. We've got a yellow one. We've got a white and yellow one. We've then got my favourite, the red one. And then at the final, taking up the rear, is a red one with a yellow one with red stripes on the wings. So pick your favourite aircraft, and that's the one you're going to be cheering on for the whole of this display. Leader today is David Hall with Andrew Monk, Alex Rainier and Richard Berry. Coming in at a 45 degree angle towards us. Now these are not very fast at all. Maximum speed of about uh, 109 knots or 210 kilometers per hour. Here we go. Diving down, building up some speed. Having a look. Clap for the aircraft that you've picked. Well, well, well done. One. Round of applause. Fantastic work. Well, Here comes your mission. Oh, now what are we going to do? Come on, little red one. You can do it. Down it goes. Come on. Yeah, well done. Absolutely fantastic. I'm going to keep score here, so that's one all. Just lining up over there, ever the professionals. That's a lovely landing. One of the joys is flying late. You can see how the blades are actually tilted backwards, about 15 degrees. That's an incredibly short takeoff, isn't it?
that's a special waving glove, that is. Gyro air display, Pete Davies. Give him a big wave, ladies and gentlemen. Flying the flag. Bishop and Richard Meredith. So the team originally flew with the Tiger Club aircraft and uh, then they reformed with two Tigers and two Stomps and uh, eventually up to four Stomps. Or a, um, or a typhoon that we'll be seeing later on today. It's breaking off. So that was a loop up into a wing over, so arcing around, keeping the momentum and the energy going, and round into a barrel roll. So this describes the shape. If you went round the inside of the barrel, it's a nice arcing roll manoeuvre, which a lot of pilots love. The British summer. Well, when it works, it's beautiful. All about waving. So the girls are going to be waving, the pilots at some point are going to be waving, and you need to wave back, please. So hands in the air, and the girls now have used their unique swivelling You, you must have a particular mindset to be able to do this. It's a lot of fun. Now, swivelling rig again. You can see they've turned sideways this time round. This is the only uh, team in the world to have these swivelling rigs. And it's the only formation display team in the world as well. And look at them waving up there. And you Give see, a big wave back. It's all in formation. So the lead wing walker sets up. it waves. That's probably all you can see sitting down, um, right tucked in the back there. You can see a lot of rivets and you can see a little bit of oil trailing down underneath the aeroplane, which it's reminds you, you've got to clean it afterwards. It's a radial engine. Yeah, they, they do leak a lot of oil. As we said earlier, that smoke system, it's a ecologically sound smoke um, developed by the team because in the good old bad days it was diesel and you just get a face full of diesel as you're sitting underneath that wing whereas this is all eco-friendly breathing friendly smoke as I told you. and Brian is touched right underneath that and some of the closest formation flying you'll see and do a display in front of your friends and family even a beluga like me you might be a bit tall I'm not saying anything about your manly chest size you might be a little tall for it look at that beautiful brain were made to display in sites like this. It's um, a beautiful kind of goldfish bowl that they can fly in, um, use the best of the terrain um, and set the display up so that it's nicely positioned in front of the public. Because this goes back to really the end of World War One and even before the end of World War One, where guys were known to get out of their aircraft to try and fix something while it was still flying. Absolutely. So wing walking is you know, 100 years old now. It's uh, 
you know, I wouldn't say it's the oldest profession, but it's definitely one of them. Um, So, smoke on go, I can hear. There we are. And you can see that the day's going to be a leg. Lots of gymnastic manoeuvres just to keep as supple as possible. They make it look incredibly easy. And the thing I hear most from people who go and do these experiences as members of the public is, well, you couldn't wave, and you definitely couldn't lift a leg. So they've got extra ailerons to help with their roll rate because rolling those things that <laughs> it was a calling and a joy and a passion. And tell me, what was your father's response when you said, Dad, I think they're going to pass Okay. I think uh, yes, my, my yes, dad, dear. yes, his, uh, his biggest uh, upset was that I moved on to um, fly with, the, with other teams. Um, I spent a year, um, well, some time in France with Brendan O'Brien, who's here today. Right, the girls have unstrapped and they're now sitting on the leading edge of the front wing. Big wave, So this manoeuvre is called the Goose, after Lucy, who, um, who perfected it a few years ago. underneath the wire and then the other leg trails backwards and hooks into the handhold on the back of the top wing and there they are they hold on with one hand and arm but also for you to see them but so, so they can maneuver up in the air so they now are standing behind the rig there we go waving away holding on with just one hand and with one foot on an area that One leg up in the air and hold on to it and see how easy it is just on the ground. Good luck with that one. Straight ahead now, into the team, the Red Arrows! in a wall formation which is approximately 300 feet from wing tip to wing tip and red one pulls them up at 4g and at over 400 miles per hour they will reach a height of five and a half to six thousand feet for the eight arrow loop Red one bringing the team round to the left hand side. Red one this year is squad leader Tom Bold. He is in his third and final year as the team leader. He is previously a synchro leader from 2017 and a former Hawk qualified flying instructor and a Takano flying instructor where he was the Takano display team pilot in 2010. And he has also flown Typhoon operationally. As the team come round from your left, get the smoke on for the Eight Arrow Presents. As the team roll out, keep your eyes and get your cameras ready for the dynamic shape change for the Vixen rollbacks. Reds 8 and 7 perform a rollback to change the shape from Eight Arrow into Vixen. And as the team come round to the right, they are in a formation known as Short Diamond. Of course, if we were a nine ship, we would have number nine at the back before demonstrating our trademark Diamond Nine formation. However, as I said, this year we are an eight ship. 
That's purely down to safety and training resources where we cannot train four new pilots in one year. So we were only able to train three. Of course, hopefully next year, and the aim is next year, to be back at our Diamond 9 formation. Get your cameras Whoa. ready for the Vixen roll. Easy up, and roll. As the team roll to the left on the right hand side of Red 1 is Red 2, Flight Lieutenant Rich Walker. He's in his first year on the team. He's an experienced aviator. He's flown both Harrier and Typhoon on operations and is also a qualified flying instructor on the Hawk Team Mark 2. Red 1 bringing the formation at 4 to 5G over 400 miles per hour and will climb into a height of 5,500 to 6,000 feet. As they reach the top of their loop, they will slow down to approximately 120 miles an hour, which makes the controlling of the aircraft even more difficult. But as the aircraft now come down, the aircraft will speed up to 200, 300 and back down to 400 miles per hour, where the aircraft now are a lot more twitchy and responsive, making the movements of the stick even more precise. As Red One brings it to the left for the Apollo present. On the left hand side of red one is red three, Flight Lieutenant Tom Hansford. With the RAF Space Command standing up on the 1st of April 2021. Of course, the RAF's capability in space is continually developing, and in this year, in two th sorry, last year in 2022, it reached its initial operating capability. On the far right-hand side of the formation is Flight Lieutenant Ollie Suckling. Red 4. Ollie's in his first, his first year on the team, a former Tornado GR4 pilot and qualified flying instructor on the Hawk Team Mark II. Those familiar to air shows will have also known Ollie as a pilot on the North Wales base Strike Master Pair. You'll have heard Red One, the way he talks there is quite robotic. That's because the way we fly formation is by ear and not by eye. That means the pilots are listening to the instruction of Red One rather than watching the movement of the aircraft on the inside of them. Which means that what we want to do is try and create a one moving wing rather than a ripple effect that goes down the wing. That's why Red One... Of course, Red One doesn't want to make this too easy for the rest of the team. So he brings the formation around to the right, the colour goes on, and it makes the difficult, even more difficult for Red 7 and 8 as they roll around the rest of the smoke in a right hand turn. You'll see that the aircraft are flying with their air brakes out, this is a small door at the rear, underneath the bottom of the aircraft. This means that the pilots fly with a higher throttle setting, producing a hotter engine gas temperature. It also disturbs the airflow outside the back of the aircraft and it makes the smoke blow and burn a lot more brightly and more billowy, which enhances the manoeuvre, which is ultimately what we're trying to do. towards the display line. They will descend down to 100 feet and will have a closing speed of over 800 miles per hour. Coming in from our left hand side is Red 6, squadron leader James Turner, the synchro leader. Each aircraft will form a 
As they now turn back towards each other, pulling up to five to six G. That means everything about them now is weighing five and six times more heavier in the cockpit than what you and I are as we stand on the ground. They point back towards the display line as they complete the manoeuvre called Cyclone. The smoke comes on as Enid come back to the display line and bank off to the left hand side. You can see the red, white and blue smoke and underneath each, each aircraft is a smoke pod. That smoke pod is capable of generating five minutes of white smoke, one minute of blue smoke and one minute of red smoke. Each colour is selectable by its own individual button on the control column. And of course, during winter training, we specially carefully choreograph the display to ensure that we have the right colours at the right time in the display. And the Red Arrows would like to give a special mention on the drawing of the heart to a young lady, Grace, who was born at 22 weeks. And that comes from all the love from her parents, Kate and Danny. Please give your hands together for the Synchro Heart. As Red A comes in from the top left and spurs the heart. As the aircraft banked to the right, you can see that famous silhouette of the Hawk aircraft. Been in service with the Royal Air Force since 1976 and it's been with the Royal Air Force since 1979. The aircraft is capable of going up to above 40,000 feet. It is capable of also travelling at a supersonic speed in a dive. And if you ask most of the pilots on the team and any pilot that's flown the Hawk, they akin this to a very small, fun sports car. And she is smoking red and blue, respectively. Oh, it's aircraft performing an aileron roll. And accelerating once again to that 400 miles per hour per aircraft as they meet back in the middle for the okay. boomerang. As Enid pull up once again for that 4G, 400 degrees, 400 miles per hour, they roll to the right. Get your cameras ready for the Enid Coronation Vertical Break. Smoke of Red Six, smoking blue is Red Seven. Flight Lieutenant Stu Roberts. Stu is in his second year on the team. He was Red Two last year and is a former qualified frontline pilot on the Typhoon, where he flew with both 12 and 11 Squadron at RAF Coningsby. And go is the calm to initiate each set of rollbacks. Red two and three smoking red and red four and five smoking blue, which is one of the hardest maneuvers for our new pilots to master each year. All around the red smoke of red six in the vortex. 
Red six, uh, Red eight ah, comes up, nestles himself it. in the middle. Get your cameras ready for the break. formation leave the infinity symbol in the sky for the infinity break midland it's been great but please put your hands together for the 2023 the red arrows in a controlled turn giving an effective visual pattern to show a heart shape in the sky dedicating as required <laughs> there we go there's the heart formation this is the team's favourite manoeuvre and this very dynamic formation again requires vast amounts of concentration and trust in one another. <coughs> so as I mentioned, while the carousel is going on, we have two separate parachutists which you can see. These are the flag bearers, okay? Start being able to hear you, so let's have a big shout out for the team as they approach the ground. Here they come, you can see now, six parachutists. They're splitting into three, or into two, lots of three. All right, so we have, firstly, Flight Sergeant Liam Lyons, who's the team coach. Secondly, Sergeant Paddy Gilwar. Third, Sergeant Andy Lynch. Fourth is Sergeant Joe Finch. Fifth, is Sergeant Greg Ashelby. Number six is Sergeant Doug McCall, who is another local lad, again from the Worcester area. So let's have a big cheer for the area of Falcons as they approach the ground. Sergeant Liam Lyons, Sergeant Paddy Gilmar, Sergeant Andy Finch, Sergeant Joe Finch, Sergeant Greg Lots of waving now to uh, Alex flying the aircraft tonight. There are over 1,000 pyrotechnics on board at the present time, and he will land with zero. He's just settling there and getting ready to launch into his display now. So get your phones out and wave them at uh, Alex. He can certainly see them like the wing walking girls today. I think that's Otto's idea of a burnout. Now these are spectacular chopper batics, originally flown by uh, Brendan O'Brien. Otto has performed all over the United States, the United Arab Emirates, Mexico, Canada, and been down to Oz as well. He said over a thousand pyrotechnics will be launched from the helicopter tonight. So get those phones out and wave them uh, to Alex. the music.
even though peripherally they're concentrating on the landing. Give them a big wave. Wave all of those phones. Beautiful landing.
David John is known to most as DJ or Gibbo. He was born in Southport and started his flying career in the Royal Navy in 1996. He knew the Sea King and the support helicopter role. As this is DJ's second year of the tutor display, he is operating at a base height of 200 feet. Uh, correction, 300 feet, 200 feet lower than previous seasons. DJ achieves 1,300 feet and rolls 90 degrees. And whilst pointing straight up before competing the stall turn at almost zero airspeed, keen enthusiasts amongst you may notice this is the only 2023 RF display where you'll be able to see a stall turn performed. DJ is now serving the Royal Air Force and when not displaying, he is responsible for training qualified military pilots to become instructors on the Grog Tutor. In his spare time, DJ flies vintage airplanes, races powerboats, and drives classic cars. He also has a penchant for Michelin starred restaurants. During his very career, DJ has amassed over 6,000 flying hours on 50 different aircraft types. The tutor is operated by Number 6 Flying Training School, primarily for UAS students and air cadets. 6 FTS is also engaged in other essential defence tasks, such as frontline mission rehearsal and training of mission support group. Five hundred pound bombs. And you can see the aircraft is highly maneuverable. Tony should bring the aircraft back in on what is called a configured pass. You can see that the undercarriage has been dropped. Configured pass, also known as a dirty pass. You often see uh, Navy aircraft performing this with the, uh, the gear down, the flaps down, the tail hook down, and the air brake out. So this is gonna be a nice slow fly past. Get your cameras ready, ladies and gentlemen. Very rare opportunity to see the Bronco. said a lot of jet pilots flew these aircraft and it seems incongruous why and also it's a lot of lighter aircraft as well it's because the pilots who were going to call in jet aircraft to support them either attacking a target or protecting someone knew the capabilities of those jets knew the lethality of the weapons that they were using nice lazy climb there. You can see under the fuselage there is a, uh, a fuel tank to extend the range or uh, loiter time. Loiter time being more important. Now this would be a typical type of uh, strafing pass. Using those four six two machine guns or uh, loosing off those folding fin rockets. Those rockets are about two and three quarter inch diameter, about uh, four feet long. The fins actually folded out. As soon as they launched out of the tubes, the fins automatically flicked out and stabilised the rocket in flight. Also told the underneath of the aircraft to strengthen to protect it from The visibility from those seats is absolutely incredible because the sides of the fusel. And he's uh, heading off from here. 
won't be uh, landing back here today. But put your hands together, ladies and gentlemen, for Tony Brook and the Bronco demo team. This is part of the Vampire Preservation Group. And here she is. There is that uh, whistling sound from the de Havilland Goblin engine. Now this is a different type of engine as uh, Mike pointed out to us here in the commentary position a little while ago. It is centrifugal flow. Now the jet engines on the Typhoon that we've seen and most jet engines, including the big fan engines on airliners, are axial flow, where the uh, air goes straight through the engine, front to rear comes in, compressed through the burner cans, through a hot end turbine and out the back. But this is completely different. In the centrifugal flow jet engine, which was the original jet engines developed by Frank Whittle here in the UK, there is a single large disc and air comes in from either side of that disc and because the disc is spinning there are special curved shapes on that disc and as the disc spins the air is drawn from the middle to the outside edge and compressed it then goes through burner cans, fuel is added, ignited hot air comes out the rear of those cans through a hot end turbine which then drives forward through to the front that very large wheel, that centrifugal flow. It uh, was the cutting edge of jet engines at that time for the Allied forces. The Germans used the axial flow in the Messerschmitt 262, the 162, and uh, also the Arado 234 jet bombers. Now, as we can see, the uh, distinctive shape, there are two, uh, like a two twin booms coming back from the fuselage. Is there a benefit to that shape yes, to the aircraft? Yes, because in those days it was a first generation jet engine, so they weren't very efficient. The longer the jet pipe from where the hot end turbine was at the end of those flame cans, the longer that went, the less efficient the engine became. So if you had a configuration where you had a jet engine inside a fuselage with a long tailpipe, it became less efficient. What they did here is shorten that distance by putting on twin booms instead of having a large, uh, a large long fuselage. Messerschmitt was actually developing a, um, a fighter with very similar configuration as well. This is uh, built by the de Havilland Company. And the Type first flew as a single-seat fighter, believe it or not, in September 1943 sandwich to build the pod that this cockpit sits on. The rest of the aircraft is uh, all aluminium, but forward of the wing there, it is all made of wood. And of course, de Havilland uh, were responsible for the Tiger Moth aircraft, which was a primary training aircraft at the, at the beginning of the uh, Second World War. And uh, they go very right much would. The, they go right the way back through to World War I, the de Havilland II fighter, the de Havilland IV, arguably the best uh, light bomber to come out of World War I. And certainly they were at the cutting edge of jet fighter design. Originally fitted with uh, four 20 millimeter cannons, the single seat version. Unfortunately, it was not the first jet to go into service with the RAF. Sister squadron to that of the Dam Bus. De Havilland, Australia, and also in India, France, Italy, and Switzerland. So. A, uh, a very uh, a prolific aircraft, over 3,200 built. Nice high speed pass there. But even then, a nice and quiet. It makes a nice change for the roar of uh, some of the engines we've heard today. This is the only Vampire currently flying in the UK, and it is uh, operated and maintained by the Vampire Preservation Group. That's right. 
This was uh, developed into many different variants, as we mentioned. Single seat fighter, two seat trainer, two seat night fighter, and um, various developments and enhancements of the vampire. Of Wingspan of 180 inches. Let's just see how quickly it gets airborne. Look at that, airborne in just a few feet. Even better than the OV-10 Bronco, I think you'd agree. Straight up into a loop. Looping the loop and defying the ground. Then a stall turn. Now, in a stall turn, it's not like when a car stalls, when the engine stops, the engine keeps going. But what does stall is the wing. The wing loses lift and the aircraft uh, pivots about its own axis. Uh, wingtip nose and other wingtip all pass through the same imaginary point on the horizon. Now showing us a plan view of the aircraft. So I was saying 180 inches wingspan, that's 15 feet, and it weighs 138 pounds. Now a four-point roll, and is powered by a four-cylinder boxer engine of 550cc. So Steve Carr, who is piloting the aircraft, built it with help from Jim and Luke Pierce. Rolling the aircraft to keep it airborne, relying on the power of the engine to keep it hanging there from the prop. Now you may have heard of the aerobatic manoeuvre known as a horizontal eight, often referred to as a Cuban eight. Well, this is a vertical eight. You can see the smoke trail is describing a figure eight standing up right there in the sky. Because with that long nose, you can't really see over the nose for real. Obviously, that doesn't apply to a radio-controlled aircraft. And let's just see how short the landing run is. Look at that. You don't need a runway the size of that at Ragley Hall to be able to fly this aircraft. I think most of us could do it from our back garden, couldn't we? <laughs> Given the absence of neighbours and trees, of course, at either end of the runway. That was fantastic, wasn't it? As you saw that... Uh... different display we've been told this afternoon we'll be having a tail chase by this uh the difference in the thickness of the wing between the Hurricane and the Spitfire there. BMF now currently operates the Lancaster, two Hurricanes, six Spitfires, the uh, Douglas Dakota and de Havilland Chipmunk for uh, tailwheel conversions. Thank you. 
stripes on the underneath of the wings. These were um, D-Day markings, they're supposed to be temporarily applied to Allied aircraft such that there wouldn't be any misidentification between friend and foe in the skies over Normandy where it would have been absolutely frantic. And uh, these were applied, they were supposed to be applied, um, I suppose, in, in a marked position. However, uh, as they were done with paints, a lot of these were just put on with paint brushes. Well, I did hear that it was dependent on the width of the broom that they had in the hangar. Of course, that, uh, that type of marking was also reintroduced for um, the Suez campaign, but they were yellow and black markings. Of course, the Hurricane used in a variety of roles. successfully as uh, bombers dive bombing. you'll see as the aircraft comes by it has afterburners which is that flame that you can see in the back of the engine which gives it the thrust it needs to go through these extraordinary maneuvers. to quick reaction alert stations for the uh, RAF and this is the raison d'etre of this machine.
maneuverability of this machine. Top speed back to 1,521 miles an hour. Those engines generating 40,000 pounds of thrust in uh, reheat or afterburner. Two Eurojet 200 engines. Equally as tough. Fitted with a Praetorian Dash Defensive Aid subsystem, can fly up to 65,000 feet. Also fitted with a Pirate Infrared Search and Track. Maneuverability down to uh, the electrons flying around in the computer plus the uh, cunards at the front. Look at that very high alpha angle of attack pass indicating how slow the aircraft can go and then he will switch back into full reheat and accelerate away. some of the team from the squadron to have a chat and some gizits which is always nice some freebies paint scheme. This one is the standard on-the-line aircraft, so there's nothing special about that, uh, that machine that appeared here yesterday. It's exactly the same as this one that appears today. Working hard for all that G is the G-suit that the pilot is we wearing, which will inflate to uh, compress the body and keep the blood in the right place as he's flying. Look at that. Remember, that's nine times your weight pushing you down into the seat. So think about your uh, quarter pounder, how much that will be. weapons about 325 <laughs> brighty 29 squadron RAF Coningsby and the magnificent Typhoon Very first flight in uh, August 1944. 
just under 1,300 produced, introduced in 1945. The squadron was actually on its way on the carrier to the Pacific Combat Theatre and uh, didn't make it before um, the cessation of hostilities. This was the last piston engine fighter aircraft manufactured by Grumman. And it was also designed to fit on the smallest air escort carriers that were available. Of course, Grumman synonymous with the Cat series, the Wildcat and the Hellcat. The Bearcat was 20% lighter had a 30% higher rate of climb and 50 miles an hour faster than uh, its younger brother, the Hellcat. It would go off and it would detach the wing, the wing tips and uh, reduce the stress on the aircraft. incredible to think you can see the aircraft climbing there now but an unmodified Bearcat in 1946 set a time to climb record to 10,000 feet so standing start 115 foot takeoff run 94 seconds to 10,000 feet and that record was not beaten for 10 years. The pilot Pete Kinsey is, a, is at home in the Bearcat as he is in a Spitfire or even a small cub. Yep. He's an extraordinarily talented pilot. And again, this is extremely rare that the Bearcat is performing away from ducks. See the ease in which that aircraft actually flies. This is one of the nicest handling aeroplanes that was produced by the US during the Second World War. French bear cats were flown by the South Vietnamese and it also uh, went into service with the Royal Thai Air Force. Only 60 of them manufactured. Partial topside, great for the photographers. The big R2800 engine just humming along there. Hardly sounds like it's doing any work at all. That was an absolute treat. Beautiful. So back out last time. Back out and ignite. Maybe one more. Look to your left, everybody. Here is the Lancaster. engineers that work on all these aircraft that you see today for the amount of work and dedication they put into keeping these beautiful and many cases historic aircraft in the air. 
Without the engineers, the aircraft do not get off the ground. Just under 7,400 Lancasters were uh, built. The aircraft first flew in January 1941. A huge modification and extension of the unsuccessful Avro Manchester, but the Lancaster certainly went on to carve its place in military history. It's incredible to think that in Bomber Command, 3,249 Lancasters were actually lost on operations. was so successful. 33 feet long, unobstructed, and could carry all ordnance, including 4,000, 8,000, 12,000, and 22,000 pound bombs. The so-called Grand Slam or earthquake bomb. And there in Europe, but also as part of Tiger Force, which was going to be the final attack on Japan. Listen to those beautiful Merlins. Perhaps of all the operations, the most famous could be considered to be that of Operation Chastise, the attack on the Ruhr dams, the Mona, the Ada, the Sorpe. Undercarriage down now to give you a slow configured pass. Lost. Just think of the losses of Bomber Command every night, night after night, going to the heart of Germany and occupied Europe. The aircraft is currently painted in the markings of W5005, leader. to imagine today the hundreds and hundreds of these aircraft that could be seen taking off from airfields all over England. Used by uh, the RAF coming in over the top from your right, perhaps for its last pass. aircraft is a former Empire Tests Pilot School machine from Boscombe Down. The other, number two, is from RAF Shawbury, used as a trainer. Number three is a HT2 from number 705 Squadron RNAS Cold Road. This is number Break. four. Break. Go. to employ what is known as Diamond, the Diamond, Diamond, tail rotor. Now basically it's derived from the French word for window. If you see the tail rotor, rather than being on the side of the tail boom, 
is actually incorporated inside the vertical fin. Now, that is far safer for operations on the ground and also it allows for higher speeds. One of the wonderful things about the helicopter is you can just stop and restart the formation. Army Air Corps, the Royal Navy, Royal Air Force and Royal Marines. Operates near Wantage in Oxfordshire. on the team to keep these aircraft flying. And Falcon Aviation, who supports the team, is currently restoring a Westland Lynx to the Falcon Photo opportunity there. Raven, back on, go. Back on, go. Well, yeah. Coming right, gently now. How's the bank gazelle? Is that okay? Absolutely fine. all the way around. See how the big the gazelles look against the uh, Team Raven aircraft. So, reminder, gazelles are going right, ravens are going left. The coming lead on the B axis, the rolling aircraft are going out. to form a, now. another brake maneuver, so the camera's ready. Smoke off, go, and brake 
Two and three into a downwards break. Learn to learn. Nothing at all. So complicated. Now. Pull it up. 
Lead Simon Shirley, Pete Wells, Barry Gwinnett, Gerald Williams, Russ Eatwell, and Mark Southern. And our visiting steerman is departing for home. Now that is a standard steer. When you prime the engine to start it, usually on the larger air. Pushing on the on the envelope. Keep the air going into it. Ah, oh, silver balloon is actually an ultra magic balloon. It's it's actually a demonstrator for ultra magic balloon. next year to something bigger and better it's been wonderful well here he is uncle bob grinstead the wind through the hair canopy is off 
Now that aircraft, the Fournier RF4, he has just had rebuilt and re, uh, recovered and he's been working incredibly hard to get the aircraft display ready. aircraft only had uh, 19 sorties. It was delivered in September 1940 and shot down on the 27th. Was 303 Squadron was the highest scoring RAF squadron in the Battle of Britain. The aircraft uh, that is being represented was actually used by Johnny Kent to uh, shoot down both a BF-110 and a JU-88. from the Battle of Britain, shooting down more Luftwaffe aircraft than the Spitfire. Used in the Battle of France, there were 10 hurricane squadrons in France, and in 11 days they shot down 299 Luftwaffe aircraft, plus 65 severely damaged. 
unmistakable around the world anywhere right the way through World War II. Because <coughs> this uh, particular aircraft wearing the D-Day markings Uh, airworthiness directive on B-17s. The Douglas C-47 or DC-3 developed from uh, two previous designs, the DC-1 and the DC-2, standing for Douglas Commercial. We certainly spoke earlier about the sound of the Merlin engine, how it was unmistakable. So is that. You, you can instantly tell whether it's a DC-3. By Lusinov in uh, Russia as the Li-2. Some of those Li-2s actually had uh, gun turrets just behind the cockpit. US Army Air Corps received its first militarised DC-3 in August 1939. And of course went on to fly throughout every country in every theatre of the war. Flew in China across the hump as biscuit bombers in uh, New Guinea, glider tugs, parachutists at D-Day, Arnhem, the Berlin airlift, Korea and also in Vietnam where they were used as transports and gunships. Can you imagine this DC-3 with six Gatling guns in Berkshire? So those were the D-Day markings. Every Allied aircraft that flew on D-Day carried those markings. So it was an instant identification friend foe. Now this aircraft flew with the US Army Air Force and then it transferred over in September 1944, transferred to the RAF. Now this is a consecutive serial number, but one, to Dragamut, which uh, also flew on D-Day. Now this, this machine, as we said, was transferred to number one heavy glider servicing unit at 38th Group Netheraven in Wiltshire and it was recovering horse gliders from the Normandy beachhead. Over 40 were recovered and flown back to uh, UK. This uh, machine not only participated on D-Day but terribly with a non-standard nose and cockpit windscreen. After a lot of service and storage, it was actually going to be scrapped and um, it, it was saved from the Catterick fire dump by Mike Woodley of Aces High with the assistance from Lord Onslow and the Imperial War Museum. Restored and in September 1939 was uh, civilian registered and it's been continuously operated by Aces High ever since appearing in over 20 movies and television series. It has been said, and rightly, that without the DC-3 or the C-47 and the Jeep, the war would not have been won. They were just... So we understand this could be the last pass. Um, so Andrew can absolutely see you from that amazing cockpit. So please raise your arms in the air, ladies and gentlemen. Massive wave all the way down the crowd line as the DC-3 that's given us this beautiful and elegant display comes past. Come on, right-hand team. We know you're the best. And the left. Ladies and gentlemen, a beautiful display. As I said, there is no country 
anywhere in the world or Antarctica or the Arctic that has not seen service. First flew in August 1944 and it was basically designed to fly off the smallest carriers possible. It was also designed to act against the kamikazes that were attacking the uh, Pacific fleets. Now, of course, Grumman, known for its fighters, both the biplane variety, then the Wildcat and the Hellcat. The Bearcat was 20% lighter, had a higher rate of climb by 30% and 50 miles an hour faster than the Hellcat. Engine versus gravity, and here we go.
sincere apologies, ladies and gentlemen. We were requested by the BBC to uh, cut the commentary until such time as they'd finished filming. That beautiful Vampire 115 there, the two-seat version, one of uh, 3,200... original design specification for this was not only to be a bomber interceptor capable of Mach 1.4 but also to be capable of flying in all weather from bases or highways and also capable of being refuelled and rearmed by conscripts with an absolute minimum of training. served with Sweden but also with Austria, Finland and Denmark. In service equipped 11 Swedish fighter and training squadrons between 1960 and 1999. 24 aircraft went to Austria.